good morning or good afternoon, as the case may be. Uh, it's morning here in North Carolina, it's afternoon in South Africa. It's my great pleasure to introduce the first of our speakers. Sorry, I should say, I'm, my name is Gordon Hull. I'm the director of the Ethics Center here at UNC Charlotte. And we're doing a series this year on African access to global research funding. And before I introduce uh, today's speaker, well, actually the first in the series, I want to do a little bit of advertising for future events. Um, the center's next event, I'm going to try to share a screen and pull this off. We're doing a series on algorithmic bias also. And so hopefully you guys can see the advertisement for Alex Hanna. She's a research scientist at Google who's gonna be talking about algorithmic unfairness, infrastructure and genealogies of data. Um, that'll be on November 30th at noon Eastern time. Uh, if you know her work, it's really, really interesting. It's getting into how it is they put together these massive data sets that then train artificial intelligence, you know, image recognition or speech recognition. Uh, so I'm, that should be a real treat. Uh, in this series on African research with access to funding, uh, the next speaker will be Nicola Mulder of uh, Cape Town, South Africa. She'll be talking on February 15th. I don't have the full information on that yet, but you can learn about all our stuff on either the Ethics Center website, which is ethics.uncc, or now ethics.charlotte.edu. Um, and when you go there, you can find links to Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. All of our talks are now going up on YouTube. So if you miss something or wanted to see what we're up to, I invite you to, uh, to do that. So today's speaker is Rafila Masekala. She is the head of pediatrics and child health at the University of KwaZulu Natal in Durban, South Africa. And rather than talk over her, I would let her introduce herself and her talk. So, Mathila. Thank you very much, Gordon. So I think let's get the technological aspects out of the way. Um, and then I will introduce myself once I'm confident my, confident my slides well. Okay, perfect. So I hope everyone can see those. <clears throat> so uh, I think as Gordon has said, I'm the head of uh, pediatrics at UKZN. Uh, so that's what I'm, where I'm based, and um, I'm also a uh, visiting professor at the Community uh, University in London. So really, I think I, I'm really honoured to have been asked to talk on this topic, because um, uh, it, it's really something that's very close to my heart. And um, I think um, in the last two to sort of um, two to three years, there's been a number of publications around global health. And I think if people who are interested in global health will know that the Lancet Global Health has actually been running a series of, on what's wrong with global health. Um, and um, I, I think they, there's, been, there's a, there are a number of challenges around uh, global health and uh, relationships between partners. And I think this um, is something that is very topical and is important um, that we address this. Um, so I have actually no conflicts of interest to declare uh, with regards to this talk. Um, so the views that I expressed are actually my own and not those of the university. So um, this is the university where I come from for those who are based in the US. Uh, this is actually the entrance to our medical school. Uh, the beautiful building on the right where you see are the research centers, the Ari and Caprisa. Our medical school, unlike this beautiful research center, is slightly older and it's almost um, 100 years old, so it doesn't look as pretty. But KZN uh, or KwaZulu Natal, where I'm based, is a, a really beautiful part of the country. Um, this is a photo of the Valley of the Thousand Hills. It's beautiful, but I think part of the uh, challenges in conducting research in this area is um, this is a largely remote. Um, a remote rural population, so access to uh, health care may be challenging in, in some context for people who live here. And of course, um, this is just a photo showing um, you know, the field work that you conduct in some of the schools. And this is uh, from a study that we just completed uh, in, in one of the schools in, in KwaZulu-Natal. 
So I think this is just to give a flavor for the US based colleagues to just show the context of where we are, um, where I'm based. So I thought that today, uh, how we, uh, what I would cover is I would define global health. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll talk a little bit about parachute or what is called helicopter research. We'll discuss the research ecosystem. What are the implications for this ecosystem and for low middle income country researchers? Or what we talk about as the global south. Uh, I'll talk about the research capacity strengthening and program. And um, I'll really want to share, um, we recently published in Anesthesia some statements to journal ed editors, specifically statements that we hope will provide guidance um, to journal editors just to level the playing field with regard to research conducted. Uh, between global health partners um, in um, the global north and global south, and then more concrete. So what is global health? I think there are a number of definitions uh, of global health, but I think one that's particularly used quite a lot, it's really an area of study or research and practice that places priority on improving health and achieving equity in health for all people worldwide. I think really whenever um, uh, researchers from the global north and the global south decide to collaborate, it's really from a point, uh, if you look at the research question that's probably being addressed, it, it usually starts off with an altruistic idea um, uh, to really improve individuals' health. And um, this is, is supposed to be really uh, to provide an equitable health um, for all individuals, uh, even those in, in poorer situations. But I think uh, there's, there's been a, a real challenge to these definitions, and quite recently, um, this is work from Shane Abimbola, um, who has really challenged the issue around the equity, that we really should put equity at the center of all the definitions between Northern and Southern partners, um, because if this is not addressed, then we will really have these uh, inequities being perpetuated uh, between partners. But I would like to go further in this talk, and I'll, I'll justify why, that I think perhaps instead of looking at not only equity, we should really look for them in the next few years to really have justice um, so that we can really level the playing field for everybody so that everybody really starts um, working um, in a more just system um, in between these northern and southern collaboration. So what is equity? So I think that, that equity is really, um, if you look at the Oxford Dictionary, it says the quality of being fair and impartial. But the WHO has defined this as the avoidance of, a, of the absence of avoidable or the need of those differences amongst groups of people whether these are defined by social structures, by economy, uh, by demographics, or where people live, so geographically. Um, and I think that's actually a really nice definition of, of equity in terms of health. And um, fairness, fairness is really just the quality of treating people equally. So um, it, it is in a way that is right or reasonable. So if you really look at the face of it, I think uh, if you look at this cartoon, you do see that, you know, equality, which is what probably we had previously in global health, uh, was not um, appropriate because if, uh, you know, um, people who, if you were uh, um, disadvantaged, there was actually, there's no uh, way, for example, you can see these are people trying to watch a soccer match or maybe in the American context, um, um, football. And um, this is very different if you, uh, for example, the, uh, 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 it's just a shorter individual on the right hand side, you really will not be able to participate if we work in an equal system. But equity really seeks to give everybody uh, a leg up so that even the people who are most disadvantaged will have opportunity to participate. And I think this, uh, in this analogy uh, with regards to global health research is to be giving if you think about the tall man would be northern uh, partners, uh, the middle man would be perhaps somebody in an upper in, in, um, middle income country, and then the, the little boy would be somebody in the low income country. 
So to really try to level the playing field so the players in, in the research ecosystem would have an equal chance to participate in research. But what is the current reality? The current reality is this, and, I, and this is the unfortunate um, uh, circumstance that really uh, uh, the high income countries have um, received, received more and more, while people for, for perhaps in low income countries are actually far below where they should be. So this inequity um, and the reality really needs to be um, structurally balanced and they have to be tools that are used to make sure that this uh, doesn't get perpetuated. So what is justice? I, I, I remember I did say that I think we need to have a more just system than an, an, an equitable system. So if you really look again at this cartoon with the same um, uh, soccer match, you can see that justice is where all the systemic barriers, all the barriers that disallow that um, person who's in a very disadvantaged position are removed so that they don't need anybody to give them a, a hand up, that they can actually participate fairly because we've actually addressed all these systemic, systematic barriers that make it um, impossible or uh, disadvantage them in this research ecosystem. So I think really uh, in future we should look to that, to having a more dust system so everyone can um, um, participate in a more fair way uh, in research. So what is parachute research? Uh, parachute research, or what people call helicopter research, is it's really defined as the practice of conducting primary research within a host country and subsequently publishing findings with inadequate recognition of the local researchers, their staff, and or their supporting infrastructure. So what does this really mean? I think, as I've said previously, when uh, people decide to, be, to collaborate, it's usually from a very altruistic position. We have a goal. We really want to make people's lives better. But unfortunately, what happened in a number of uh, uh, cases is uh, uh, northern partners come into the host country, they normally have the funding already secured, they come in with a wonderful protocol which has been developed, of course, from a, a northern perspective, what Shay uh, Abimbola refers to as a foreign gaze. So somebody looks from a northern perspective and says, oh, there's a problem in this low middle income country, let me go and solve it. So a protocol is developed in the, in the high income country, a grant proposal is sent, it's submitted, it's accepted, and then they go into the um, low and middle income country and say, well, guys, we've got this protocol, we have the funding, we can do the research, can we collaborate? So unfortunately, what happens is then the low middle income country researchers chaperones the research through the ethics committee because it would not otherwise be acceptable without the low middle income country researcher. They get all the field workers, they conduct the field work, but unfortunately, that's where usually the relationship stops. That once that process is complete, when it comes to the uh, data analysis, the curation of the data, the writing of the manuscripts, the submitting to journal and publications, either the researchers in the low middle income country are not acknowledged, the people who actually conduct the fieldwork are not acknowledged, and or if the middle income country researcher is acknowledged, they sandwich somewhere in the middle as one of the middle authors um, and not really given um, a really recognition for the work that they've done in terms of participating in this whole process. So I think that is what is regarded as parachute, parachute research. Now, if we look at the research ecosystem, of course, when you conduct research, we know that you, you have to really look at everything. Uh, a number of uh, key players are involved in this ecosystem. So the Wellcome Trust describes uh, a research ecosystem um, really based on, on the various constituent elements in the research ecosystem. Of course, you need to have researchers who come up with ideas. They will have outputs. You will have research managers. You have institutions that these researchers are linked to. Uh, other universities or research institutes, you have funders who come with the money, you have governments who sometimes do contribute to the funding, 
We have the policy makers who have to uh, take up policy that is guided by the research that's generated. You will have communication specialists who communicate findings of these um, of the research uh, or the knowledge production. And then you also have the private sector, which sometimes, as well as, uh, for example, um, um, philanthropic organizations that will support and fund uh, research. So this is what the Wellcome Trust describes as the ecosystem. So I, I did uh, allude to the fact that we recently published this consensus statement around um, uh, inequities in global health and how we can make um, uh, global health better. Now, when we actually sat down to um, uh, look at this uh, and write this consensus statement, uh, we were a group of uh, researchers uh, from Africa, clinicians, people that work in research institutes, um, a, a number of journal editors, other clinicians, clinicians from um, uh, uh, the global north, as well as other partners. So we sat together as a group and um, went through a process to really try to develop this, a consensus statement um, uh, that was really uh, directed at journals. Uh, and I'll talk to that in a little bit, why we specifically targeted journals as the first uh, um, uh, area uh, for, 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 for really addressing in terms of global health relationships. So we really um, came up with this definition um, where we said we think that um, uh, the research ecosystem is really a dynamic system of local, national, and international institutions as well as actors that are involved in the commissioning of research. So those would be the people who think that the research needs to be done, for example, the funders uh, who generate the research, the researchers, the management of the research, the curation, as well as the dissemination and consumption of research. But we also added that these people have different interests they have, uh, and they have different types and level of capital, which we'll discuss in a little bit, and they're linked and affected by feedback loop systems of influence and power. And I think that, that the key thing here is around the influence and power, because it's the imbalances in this in influence and power that has really perpetuated the cycle of inequity uh, in global health, as well as the, um, of course, in, in an inadvertently provoking, in some instances, parachute research. So when we looked at this research ecosystem, I think um, the, the one thing I want to point out from this cartoon is, uh, let me see if I can put a pointer. So all the circles that you see in this are have various uh, sizes, and that is not by accident. So you will see that in the middle of this research ecosystem are the funders, because they are the people that will generate the funds, that will support um, the research that is generated. But if you look at the other um, circles, you will see that, of course, governments in high-income countries do contribute substantially to research uh, funding. And product and and because they do contribute significantly to funding, they can set with the funders a research agenda. So they will determine what they think are the key priority areas, what they're willing to fund, how they're willing to fund it, and they basically will set the agenda around what knowledge is produced and where it is produced. Now Again, you'll see again that another big part of this ecosystem are the high-income country researchers. Because they have uh, these linkages that you'll see that the arrows between the funders and high-income countries are quite large, quite strong. So there's strong links to the um, funders as well as the high-income country governments. And um, they will then set priorities of what areas in research should be. Um, uh, looked at, and they will also determine what sorts of research questions need to be answered. And the journals, uh, which are at the top, are actually one of the key players in research.
because we know that whatever you generate, if it's not published, it doesn't exist, it's not known. And unfortunately, in terms of research, um, publication and publication in high impact journals um, are what drives these individuals in high income countries to actually participate in this. And we know that um, in terms of academic profession, uh, promotion, uh, the more you publish, the better you, you are, you, the better chance you stand to, to be promoted, the better stance, chance you stand to even have more funding to conduct more research. So it becomes a self perpetuating cycle because these journal editors have such power because they can actually determine where these researchers land. And they also do influence funders as well because the knowledge that they generate and what they decide is important in terms of publication will also influence funders. But I'm going to come back to this because remember we're talking, if we're talking about northern and southern partners, really we're trying to improve health for people who are the most disadvantaged, who are communities in low middle income countries, who are the looked after by the southern partners. So do you see the circle of the communities that all these people are concerned about is very small? That is for a very important reason. Because when the research agenda is set, it's set in high income countries by people who probably have very little knowledge about the communities where the work will be done, the knowledge in the indigenous knowledge systems about the people in these communities. And um, whatever interventions are being proposed, these communities have not been engaged or even asked whether whatever interventions are being uh, proposed will work in these communities. And the only link that these communities have with research is actually the low middle income country researchers. These southern partners are, as I've said before, not really included in the agenda setting. They're not included in the priority setting, in deciding what questions need to be asked and how or what interventions are being proposed to these local communities. So what sometimes can happen, which does unfortunately happen at times, is if for any reason there is a tension between what questions are being asked and the researchers in the low middle income countries and the answers that are being sought, um, they can impact how the community sees the low income country researchers or even governments if whatever research is proposed they is actually against local government policy. A classic example of this I'll give was in the South African context, for example. When we had the HIV epidemic, there was a lot of research around HIV uh, antiretroviral therapy. There was at that at one stage a lot of resistance from our government, from our health minister, telling the healthcare sector that we should be using beetroot and all sorts of other ridiculous therapies to treat people with HIV, and our president didn't believe that HIV existed. So this put researchers in, in clash with the government at that stage, and um, communities also, because of what they read, found it, it made it slightly more difficult for communities to accept antiretroviral therapies and research related to it, for example. So it's quite important that all these uh, other key players do consult the local researchers and the low middle income country researchers to A, also assist in the agenda or priority setting or key areas that need to be addressed, and B, to also give some context in terms of the communities where this work will be conducted. Right. So I'm going to use Africa as a case study and um, just show in the African context 
way things can really go wrong between these partnerships before I uh, propose what can be done better. So we know that of the billion or over a billion people that live in Africa, they comprise 15% of the world population. But unfortunately, a quarter of the global burden of disease is born in Africa. But if you look at the research outputs in terms of data that's generated, only 2% of the research is generated from African research. And just if you look at this world map, it's not by accident. And this world map just showed the World Bank map showing different uh, incomes of various countries. The green countries are high income. The uh, red ones, or oh, uh, maroon, is low income countries. And the low, uh, low middle income countries are orange. And upper middle income countries is the light green. You will see that. The majority of low middle income countries are actually based in Africa, the, the, the highest proportion. And the majority of low middle income countries are also in Africa, with only a number of countries being classified as upper income countries in Africa. So it's not by accident that the, the knowledge production is um, very low in, in Africa. Now, this was an interesting publication. Um, this was an analysis done, uh, published now about uh, almost three years ago in the Lancet Lang Global Health, where um, the author actually analyzed um, data or, or research that was published in the Lancet Global Health between 2013 and 2017. And she really looked at about 236 publications where the research generated involved global health partners. So that would be partners from a um, high income country as well as a low income country. And what was really interesting from this was that if you look at the coverage in terms of region for these uh, global partners, the majority of research was actually held in either South Asia or Africa, almost half. But when the publications were analyzed by authorship, so that there were authors that were based in Africa on these publications, um, only 44% of authors were actually uh, included in publications and they were African. And this was not, uh, they didn't look at, you know, the seniority of first or last authorship, that, that just that there was an author. It was slightly better for South Asia at 53% and Southeast Asia at 56%. So showing that although we all acknowledge that parachute research is wrong, it's still happening. And, it's, and these are publications from the Lancet Global Health, which has now come with a very strong statement against this uh, practice. So, I think that the challenges in terms of Africa and why we still have these um, practices is then at many levels. So if you look at the macro level, we know that research funding opportunities are much more limited for African researchers. And this is really linked to the fact that African countries or governments have not committed to the agreed upon uh, contribution that every country to contribute about 1% of its GDP to research. This has not been achieved in many countries in Africa. So there's really a lack of political will to actually um, commit funding to research. If you look at individual health in low middle income countries, the finance support and infrastructure that whether it's based at universities or research institutes is poor. They Research grant management infrastructure may not also be as strong. This is all related to human resources funding, access to uh, funding for individuals, as well as the administrative support. So many researchers in low middle income countries actually um, have multiple functions. They may be a clinician and a researcher, a researcher after hours, because they don't have 
an administrator to help them with the grant management. They don't have an admin someone to assist them with the grant writing. They don't have a, 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 an administrator to even help them with their own admin. So this really poses a huge burden to uh, individuals that are based in low middle income countries to not only participate in research, but to who have very little protected time to allow them to conduct research. And this will be explained in a little while when we talk about um, uh, publications. So people have very high clinical load. And I think that this is, uh, as a pediatrician, you know that the World Health Organization recommends that you should have at least 10 pediatricians per 100,000 population. And um, in high income countries, for example, in the UK or Germany, for example, you have almost 90 per 100,000. But if you look at statistics from Africa, we have less than one pediatrician per 100,000 population. So you can just see that just looking at the numbers, the burden or the clinical burden for any individual who's based, for example, in Africa, is so much higher. They have a huge clinical load, and then they're also expected to still conduct research. So this is a, an important uh, burden that needs to be looked at. So people have really huge administrative loads. We know that there's issues of salaries. And I think here, when I talk about salaries, we know that one of the other challenges about uh, global health research is a lot of funders are more comfortable funding uh, research institutions that may be housed in low middle income countries, but they form these um, units in low middle income countries and get researchers from the global north to come and work in these um, uh, research institutes. And unfortunately, what happens is usually they have disparate salary scales. So people who are coming from high income countries get a one salary scale. And those uh, that are uh, the individuals that are locals to the low income country have a different salary scale. And these inequities just perpetuate the cycle and the inequity that's linked to these relationships. So even in a context where people are housed in the same institution, you may even have injustices in this system, despite the fact that they're working in the same research institute. So these are some of the challenges that will make it more difficult for researchers to then, um, you know, get through the glass ceiling to attain um, uh, uh, research um, uh, to, to maintain a research career and uh, a sufficient trajectory in terms of their research career. And of course, this then would lead to poor attention. So if people feel undervalued, which happens a lot, the best researchers then leave the low middle income country setting, they leave the global south and migrate to the north um, to get better opportunities. And this is unfortunately what happens. So I think I've addressed the issue of the agenda setting. But one thing that also happens in these contexts is researchers have this, what a lot of middle income countries or southern partners have what we call this stuck in the middle phenomenon. Now, of course, we know that the currency of um, academia is publications. But publications and having a name to a publication is not always just that. You also need to be in a senior uh, authorship position, to be a corresponding author, to be the last or senior author. These positions mean something and are currency in terms of academia. So if people are part of collaboration, partnerships in global health, but they're continuously author number 10. If they apply for promotion, these are the matrix that we use as a guidance to see whether somebody is productive, someone is leading research, and unfortunately, this is what happens to a number of researchers. And in this publication by Kelaha, 
um, who looked at publication from Africa, the number of publications has definitely risen. There's no question about that. But if you look at the authorship position, the majority of authors uh, from these global partnerships, the increase in terms of uh, first authorship positions was actually higher from Global North partners, so it increased even more. And um, although there was an increase in first authorship position of, of, of almost three times, if you really dissected the data, unfortunately, as I've shown in the previous cartoon, the majority of these first author positions, if you look at them, were mostly from the upper middle income countries. So the slightly more privileged people in the middle and the people who were in the low income countries were even more disadvantaged. So their trajectory in terms of the increase in authorship, the first authorship, which is the most prized, were not as you would see with the other um, the other high in or, or upper middle income countries. So there is even that disparity amongst those that are disadvantaged. And interestingly, uh, 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 in this paper that was published in the BMJ, there was uh, this uh, Naidu and colleagues did an analysis on COVID publications since the pandemic. And when they really analyzed these publications, about a fifth of papers that had Africa as the site or where the research was conducted. There was not even a single researcher from Africa in any of these publications um, quoted. So although we are having a push towards uh, preventing this predatory or parachute type research, it's still happening even in 2020-2021. So the inequities will continue. And unfortunately, part of the problem is also related to the data being generated, not being having no ownership from the southern partners. A lot of the time, and unfortunately, this is what happens when publications from these partnerships, if you can call them partnerships, happen. Uh, early career researchers who may have done the bulk of the work and not acknowledged, underrepresented groups and minorities, for example, females, are not supported or even um, provided with some acknowledgement in terms of authorship in these relationships. And I think I've also addressed the issue of unequal pay. So, I talked to some extent around the issue of community and community participation. I think most of us, when we do write grants, we have to write a statement about, you know, have we engaged the community where we're doing the research? Have we consulted them? And in most grant applications, I haven't seen one way people have said, I've ignored, I haven't really spoken to people in the community. But it's quite important to get that participation of the community. And we looked at this, um, myself and uh, Andy Bush just wrote this recently for the Journal of pan African Thoracic Society, where we really looked at why sometimes, and we just had a, a case study of, of a huge, very well-funded study, that was done looking at community acquired pneumonia in children. And the study, which was funded, it was a huge, uh, well designed study, which had all the ethical approvals, et cetera, was unfortunately, it was a multi center study in one of the countries where the study was conducted. They just had to stop enrollment because there was um, community. Um, dissatisfaction and um, a, real, a real media funeral and now a, a legal case against why the study was done because it was deemed unethical. So it's, it's, it's 
critically important to also involve all the stakeholders in whatever research is conducted, because the, the study that we, we use as a case study, which was funded to the tune of over 2, 000, 2 million pounds, is did not have a result because they just couldn't enroll enough participants to actually meet the primary outcome uh, analysis of the outcome. So this was an unfortunate case. But one of the things that we proposed in this editorial was perhaps we should really look at other ways where we could get local community as well as endorsement of, of peers in communities. So for example, if, if, if for example, the same um, protocol was developed and there was a peer review amongst other lung health researchers in Africa, and this peer review happened prior to the study being done. And this would give some comfort to communities to say, look, even our own researchers have looked at this and they think that this question that is being asked is number one, valid. Number two, it's endorsed, it's deemed ethical by people in this very context. And forming, for example, a, of course, in our society, a peer mechanism or peer review system of these kind of large trials, collaborative trials, would really help to mitigate against what happened in this instance. Again, all stakeholders in the community need to be involved and um, really uh, engaged as to why research questions are being asked, why certain methodologies are being proposed, so that everybody is taken along and um, we avoid having wastage, basically, which is basically what happens if you cannot uh, actually answer the question that you find. Of course, there are many guidance documents that have been around for many years um, around global health partnerships and how to manage them and what is good research conduct and good practice between partners. There's a CORED, uh, the Swiss Commission, the Essence Guidelines, and also the Montreal Statements on, on Research Integrity. And hopefully, the next one in the next World Congress, we will have another statement um, around uh, these collaborations. And it's really important that people engage, engage in a very positive way with these documents because they've been around for many years. But unfortunately, these standards have not been adhered to in some instances and that's why this inequity is perpetual. So what is the future? How can we make this better? I think it's important that funders do realize this um, issue, acknowledge it, and really uh, talk to researchers in low middle income countries to ask them and um, uh, really let them be part of the solution in setting up the research agenda, because they're the ones who are aware of the local policy gaps, they're aware of where the challenges are, and they can help in reshaping or rebalancing the system. Of course, governments need to also play their part. They need to allocate budget to research and be uh, supportive of research, because without data, you cannot take policies, you cannot make economic decisions, and this is important that they uh, do realize the importance of, of this. As I've said, journal publishers and editors have a lot of power in the system, and they need to make concerted effort to mitigate against these uh, practices and be uh, lead or chart the way forward to lead in making the situation better making the situation more just. And research capacity strengthening and training um, low and middle income country researchers in research methodology, um, writing, uh, uh, upskilling, uh, language. These are barriers that many early career researchers 
space in low middle income countries. And having programs that can support and strengthen these things will uh, firstly increase confidence. And when people are empowered, they have a voice uh, and can also voice their concerns when they see things maybe going wrong between these collaborations between northern and southern parties. So as I've said, we have uh, published a statement, this consensus statement to promote of equitable authorships in publications. Uh, this was in the September um, uh, Anesthesia Journal. It was published in September. So what did we propose to journal editors in this uh, statement. We suggest that, like we signed the, I, uh, the International Journal, uh, Committee of Medical Journal editors, the IJMC criteria that we have to sign whenever we submit any paper to a journal, that journals should have reflexivity statements that authors should um, address prior to submission, and that uh, I'll show you in, in the next uh, slide, uh, other things that the editors should review before they accept the publication from global uh, partnership. And we really use the IJ, uh, ICMJE criteria to really look at the various areas where things could potentially go wrong in this relationship. So we started with conceptualizing of the study. So firstly, to ask the researchers, how does the study that you do address the local research and policy priorities? And whether local research is actually included in the study design? Then you go on to research management. Has there been any funding um, in this partnership to support local research teams? And when you look at the acquisition and the analysis of data, how the research staff who conducted the data collection acknowledged, how many members of the partnership were provided with actual access to the, uh, the data, um, did they actually have access and could review it and analyze it, and how were the data used to develop, develop analytical skills within the partnership? So the issue of skills transfer is critical there. The interpretation of data, how were the partners, uh, did the partners collaborate in interpreting the data? And I think here is we know that there's also a skills gap in many instances in terms of data interpretation and really supporting um, uh, researchers to A, understand data analysis, uh, interpretation, is part of a learning process that partners could, could, could use as an opportunity during uh, the partnership to capacitate um, the other partner. Again, when the drafting and the revising of the intellectual context, the manuscript, were there, was there any support in terms of writing skills? For example, in a context where people are not first learning English language speakers, it may be difficult for people to then um, constructively then sit and assist with the draft. But I will show you in a little bit how you could also use this as an opportunity and use other tools to um, include people who may not be strong English language speakers and write as well as you can, but you could use other tools, for example, to make them participate. You could have a verbal autopsy of the manuscript and, and take concepts from people who, don't, who are not first English language speakers because they may be able to verbalize what they would like to add and that, in a way, is intellectual contribution. And if there were any research products that were uh, shared to address the local needs. And here again is the issue of authorship. And how is a leadership contribution and ownership of this work by low middle income countries? Early career researchers were they acknowledged? 
And is there any kind of gender balance in terms of the authorship? Now, when we talk to authorship, I think one of the things which I will talk to in a minute is around the limitations that uh, journals usually make in terms of the number of authors. This has also created an environment that makes it easier for people to exclude. So having these arbitrary restrictions that you can only have six authors is what has also perpetuated and worsened the situation for people in low middle income countries as well as early career researchers. Um, so it's, it's important and something that we highlighted that journals should really look at carefully because they also have become part of the problem in setting these limits. Another important thing which we uh, also suggest is that having these uh, restrictions that you need to have one first author and one last author, um, and that's why you get people who are then stuck in the middle. And from this publication that we've uh, actually published, we have three first authors and three senior authors. So it is possible. It's just that there has to be a mind shift change around journal editors and journals and how they view these authorships. Uh, because there's a way to equalize or make the system more just. And we could use these tools to facilitate um, the process and getting rid of these you know, you only want, you need one first author. Why can't you have more? It's possible. People may have the same uh, intellectual contribution and have put enough sweat and blood and tears into the work, but you can't, they're not acknowledged because you only have one first and last author. Training was another thing. Whether there's any training that was done uh, linked to the uh, project, the infrastructure, was there any improvement in the local infrastructure as well as issues around governance? Of course, this is also dependent on the size and the breadth and the funding of the research. If you have a small project between two or three people, obviously you may not be able to contribute to the local research infrastructure. But there has to be a, a seed planted to authors before they even uh, write protocols the next time when they want to submit to the journal, to your journal, if they know that they're going to be asked these questions, they will then slowly will be able over time to address these issues and slowly we hope um, the uptake will result in people considering all these things prior to them even thinking of writing a protocol and engaging with these uh, criteria or statements before they even start their research. What we also propose then for journal editors is that they should answer a few questions as well. There was those would be around engagement, whether the author actually engaged with the reflexivity statement, was there any core development of the research, looking at the authorship, the authorship positions, whether there's early career researchers, whether a low middle income country, uh, country author is either first or last author, and if not, if, if not why, as well as um, one critical component around data sharing and dissemination, whether there was uh, sharing of the data with uh, uh, the northern southern partners, and the another important barrier is around open access. If um, Data is generated from communities low in some countries. The data or the results of the data of the data is then published in a journal where if you have to download the publication to look at the results as a either local um, government or policymaker, you have to pay five hundred dollars, that then becomes a barrier for the same very community where you conducted research to actually access. The research that really open access policies should really be adopted by journals, especially where you have these global health partnerships, so that the very people that the data is generated for can have access to it and use it constructively to guide policy 
and to really make an, an impact in those very communities where the data is generated. So the issue of open access is really critically important and we believe uh, if this is adopted, that it will make a big difference. And I'm, I'm really um, quite glad to say that since we published this in Anesthesia Journal, a number of journals have actually um, thought to adapt these statements and to use them in their, in their journals um, to really facilitate and look at uh, global health partnerships. And the number of journals, with the Nature uh, plus Global Health, have also uh, looked at this statement and are thinking of uh, using it in their own journals. So we hope that this uh, will assist in them really living the playing field. Now, I, I did talk about this uh, criteria and the, I, uh, the International um, Committee of Medical Journal Editors that we all have to sign when we submit data. And Nadia um, uh, Samagudu, who's um, based in Nigeria, actually wrote this editorial very recently, I think it was uh, two weeks ago, in the BMG, BMG Global Health. Really looking carefully at what happens in these global partnerships that people use to exclude rather than include people. And that we, in, in terms of global health, if we really need to look at other ways, strategies, to be more inclusive rather uh, than exclusive, using these very criteria. We know that whoever acknowledges an author has to uh, make contribution to the concept, design, acquisition, and analysis of data. They have to have revised and critically reviewed the, the, the manuscript. They should give final sign off of the manuscript. And they should also agree to be accountable to work. Now, what generally happens is most low middle income countries uh, uh, researchers easily fulfill criteria number one. They do. They are the ones who go out, get the field work, get the ethics, do all the hands on work. But where people sometimes are not included is around the interpretation of data and really uh, talking about other ways of um, facilitating this, which I've discussed previously. There may be issues about revision as well as the intellectual content. I've addressed how you could mitigate against that by you know, having Zoom meetings like we are now, discussing the data, and then somebody sitting down and writing what you've discussed. Um, sign off. Um, I think Shay gave, gave a very brilliant example when we're having a webinar on this. He's a um, chief editor of BNB Global Health. And there was a paper that was submitted. It was a global health partnership. The manuscript was submitted and there was not a single investigator from the low middle income country. So when the uh, first author was asked, why are there no people from the setting where this data has been collected? The answer was, we couldn't get final sign off because we sent an email and because of COVID pandemic, the, we couldn't get a response from the low middle income country colleagues. What is very interesting is when partners are trying to initiate research, it seems that no matter how busy people are, they can actually access people. They can get hold of them somehow. But when they're supposed to sign off, and it's actually the most critical part of the whole cycle of the knowledge generation, if somebody doesn't respond within 24 to 48 hours, then of course they haven't responded we can't find another way to get hold of them, so we're going to exclude them. We are living in a world where we have WhatsApp, we have phone, phones, we have other ways to get people to have final signals. So it's important that we look at other ways 
that will facilitate inclusion rather than exclusion. So it's quite important that um, in, in these relationships, uh, inclusion becomes the message rather than exclusion. So um, I, I think the core message from this is that these criteria were created not to make sure that people are not included, but that we should rather look at facilitation of inclusion rather than exclusion. So what about research capacity building or spending, as we call it now? Because I think building has a context that people in the local middle income country context do not have anything. Of course, there's knowledge. So it needs to be strengthened. So one of the programs that I'm involved with that I co directors the Pan-African Thoracic Society is a lung health research methodology training program. This program was actually started now uh, in 1990 by um, Sonia Bush, who's in the picture. It was, she was actually the president of the American Thoracic Society and she saw that there was a need to improve capacity in low middle income countries uh, to, to really capacitate researchers to conduct good um, quality lung health. This uh, program has now, um, is now in many countries globally. Uh, we have the African program, which is uh, with the Pan-African Thoracic Society. There's one in India, uh, China, Turkey, as well as South America. And this program, we've trained over 230 and 80 early career researchers in Africa. It's uh, been largely funded by a US-based, uh, UK-based uh, funding from these lung health research projects. But what I, why I mention this is we have recently just, um, it's been accepted for publication, sent this to the Lancet Global Health to say, if we invest in these sorts of programs, if we capacitate researchers in, in Africa, we can make Africans generate their own data. They can ask their own questions, they can address their own problems, and they can guide policy if there is strengthening capacity in, in low middle income countries. And why we also wanted to share this was Initially, as I said, this program was uh, be, uh, initiated by the ATS. But what has happened from when I started, I, I actually joined this program as a, um, an early career researcher. When I started very early in my career, I actually went through the program. And it was largely, the training was by uh, Americans, and I think one or two British people. And that's what it was. We had this training program for Africans, but it was um, really uh, run by uh, uh, Americans. And it was very, an excellent program. But what has happened over the last number of years with, these, with the understanding that we have really flipped script in the program. The current co-directors were part of the initial training, so myself and Uju Ojo from Nigeria, she's also the co-director. We flipped the script in terms of most of the faculty currently, about 70% is actually African researchers based in Africa, senior researchers, because mirroring is an important issue in terms of for our students to see that they can do it themselves as well. Um, now we have this African-led research um, faculty, and the, with what we've seen is the importance of funding and providing seed uh, funding for these young researchers so that they can go back to the community and generate their own data. And the strength is from this, we've had a lot of cross-sectional studies, we've had lots of studies that have been generated just from this of students. And from this, we also acknowledge the value of mentorship. And mentorship is key 
in success to these sectors. And I think this is where we could really harness the global relationships because now with um, the use of electronic media, Zoom platforms, it's easy to provide mentorship and most importantly in research networks for these young researchers to really um, uh, take themselves ahead in terms of their research careers and generating and producing good quality data. So when we really analyze uh, this program, we analyzed for the last five years to just see where we are with this uh, program. Uh, this is just the basic uh, demographics of our cohort. If you, and if you look at the mean age, as opposed to, for example, in Europe or the US, that our early career researchers are generally much older. Uh, and early career researcher in the US and UK is usually somebody who's a little bit younger. Ours were almost mm, 40. But we also wanted to analyze, because this course is actually structured across three levels, that the person who finishes the three levels, what sort of productivity do they have? And when we looked at the, the 20 students who had finished over the last five years, because it's a three-year program, we found that the average number of publications that these uh, young individuals produce, or very young, was about 10. So 10 publications uh, from when they started the course to, the, to, to, to where they were at the moment. And of those 20 students, they had produced almost 200 publications among themselves. Most importantly, looking at whether they were first authors. Again, uh, the average number of first authorships was about one. The majority had published in international journals, and I'll explain why the one is the case. Most of our students actually published as collaborators because we have to encourage lots of South-South collaboration. So, in these publications, when we analyze it, we find a lot of uh, our students would publish as groups because we encourage them to do either multi-country or a, a, a national study. So a lot of them have actually published in, in international journals. And they had also published some of them with their faculty mentors or leads in these publications. So, of course, if you strengthen capacity, you would you will increase the knowledge generation, you will increase South South partnership. But I think there is value in us redressing this ecosystem. I think with our um, submission to the anesthesia, the reflexivity statements, journals have now we've offered a tool for them to try to address some of these imbalances. The funders also need to acknowledge that they really need to uh, look at low middle income researchers and interact with them, and to really redress this imbalance in this research ecosystem, to try to level the playing field so that all the players in this um, ecosystem have a fair chance. Mommy. And I would like to acknowledge Hello, my apologies. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, and that is uh, the end of my talk. Well, apologies for that last sound bite. Wow, yeah, that, thank you so much. There is so much there, and I think. Uh, what I like if you're assuming you're assuming you are comfortable with this, just open the floor and people can ask questions as they have them. Yeah. Great. I have a question. <laughs> Let's wait for people. Um, thank you so much. That was great. And I um agree with Gordon. There's so much there to think about, and I think I'll be dissecting a lot of that um for a while to come. But I'm thinking in particular about the statement 
um, that, that you put together with your co-authors and thinking about implementing it in a journal. And I'm wondering if you have sort of wise words about how an editor might process the answers to those questions. Um, it seems like some of the conversations that could be generated would be a little tendentious. <laughs> and I think that's part of the purpose, right? And so I support that. And, and I'm trying to think about the um, guidepost for processing the information. At what point does it rise to the level of we won't publish this, um, even if everything else about the work is fine? Um, mm -hmm. And and when do we send it back and ask them to, you know, at a certain point, if they're coming to you, they've already done the research. And so they're not going to go back and re-involve the community, right? So, and again, I know um, that's part of the point. And, and yet I'm also thinking, well, what would I do as an editor when I get that stuff that's already at that point, you know, is this, it, do, we, do we look at this as the beginning of a conversation that we want people to keep reflecting on or are we actually using it partly as a, a, a part of the review process? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you've actually hit the nail on the head. The, um, there are a number of journals that will just not publish your data if you have, um, they, you've been asked the question and you haven't explained in an adequate way why you haven't done it, why there's no local involvement. The BMJ Global Health won't, the Lancet Global Health won't. So I think we are sort of moving in that direction that if you actually do do that, you do conduct parachute research, some journals would just not publish your work. Um, I, I think it, it's harsh, but to some extent it's right. Because the case study that I told you about, what happened was when the revisions were sent, all the co-authors were actually there. They were reflected. So it does make a positive change if people are now aware that if I do this, the next time there'll be, I'll find it more difficult to actually submit it to journal XYZ because it will not be accepted. So I think, uh, it is being done in certain journals, not all, but this is also to just bring awareness so that where there's gaps, they can be sort of closed. And and um, these, um, I don't think, from my experience with editors anyway, they're not um, shy to ask questions. And I think asking questions is not a bad thing because A, it is sometimes as a researcher, you feel aggrieved. <laughs> Um, but it, 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 it's when we do ask these hard questions that the system will change. And unless we do, we will always not have a balanced and just system. So I had sort of a, I guess, related question. Are, are you getting anywhere with open access to material? Like, I know there's the, the, the data access question and the published version of the article access question. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. journals are just nasty about that and paywall and everything. I know. So um, I think one of the things is, I think people should really look at the OEDC lists, you know, that really, um, if, if, if people, um, uh, you know, maybe allowing access to individuals in these OEDC countries, um, so the, the lower country, income country, to offer them access. Um, if, if the data is there, they should really be provided with the access, especially where the data is actually generated in their country and they cannot afford to look at the article, which is what happens a lot. Um, so, I, I, and this is what happens, then people replicate the same study because they just couldn't afford to you know, pay the, you know, Imagine you're just a young person, you can't pay $250 to download something, and you just then redo the same study that someone else has actually done with probably more funding and better. Um, so it's important that um, we start the conversation, and I know that it's hard times for many journals, but we need to make some concessions um, in order to be more fair. Yeah, thank you.
Um, other thoughts? Okay, I see we have a question in the chat. Uh, what do you think is the academic institution role in cost work publication of research from LMIC? Is it enough that they just contribute a portion to the all? Well, this is a very uh, important uh, question. Um, I think uh, universities also have a role to play because they are also part of this research ecosystem. Because in, in many low middle income countries, some universities actually don't even contribute to the costs. Um, and I think it's, it's important that it, as these universities, really the, 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 the currency of the university is knowledge generation, right? You need to publish. And the, the, the institutions should really look at supporting uh, researchers by really looking at funding and paying for 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 these open access um, um, for open access but unfortunately some of these costs are very high and uh, are not really affordable and that's why I think for people that are in collaborations where there usually is some or sufficient funding they uh, that, that universities have to really critically look at their role in this ecosystem as well and support early career researchers. I absolutely support that. Uh, thanks, Eva. That's a valid question. I have a follow-up action. Have you come up with successful arguments for um, pushing funders in this direction? I've had some experience myself with coming up against, you know, there's the, the infrastructure point that you brought up which is almost enough to defeat you on its own, you know, just the, all the things you need, for example, in the States to receive federal funding, you need personnel, multiple personnel and systems to process the funding. Um, but it's even things like uh, there's a predominant view in the States for human subject research that um, should be equality in pay. So equal pay for equal work when people participate and trying to push back against that and have an equity lens on payment to people. So you have differential payments for the same participation. It is sort of like an act of Congress, as we say in the States, right? that you need to have a lot of um, machinery moved around for that. So I'm wondering if you've had success in uh, helping funders move the needle there. Um, my experience actually with conducting research with funding locally is I find it so difficult because they have these rigid rules. You can only have this funded, you can't have this funded. And, and I think really we need to have engaged funders who understand the dynamics of what we work with, the dynamics um, of what challenges researchers face to um, become a little bit more flexible in terms of what they will uh, support with the funding envelope. For example, uh, research infrastructure is not part of the deal. You can buy equipment, um, you can go and buy all sorts of toys, but you, you cannot give somebody a good chair to sit on and a good desk and lighting. So those things are, are really underrated, but they're what makes a system work. Um, so I, I, I haven't been as successful. If I do, I'll let you know, Lisa, but it, 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 it's, it's just these, um, I think we're so set in how the system has worked. It's very difficult to shift. <laughs> um, uh, all these little players to be as supportive as possible, to look at the reality and try to, um, make it easier for people to conduct research rather than making it harder because some of the time when you're looking at the, the finances you just want to die because you cannot pay for this but you can pay for that you can't do this but you can do that and usually the things that are funded don't make any sense if you're looking at capacitating your your environment mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and you need a full-time person who has done this repeatedly, who remembers all of the Byzantine arcane funding rules too. So you have the, the staff and problem becomes, you know, for yeah, for early for research that becomes insurmountable in some ways. Mm -hmm. Um have we had other thoughts today? Well, if folks are winding down, then you should join me and thank you, Mozilla, uh, for that yeah, fascinating talk. And um, yeah, it's amazing work you do. So thank you for sharing with us. Thank you. Thanks, Gordon. And thank you, Lisa, for both great kind invitations. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a well, have a good day. We are going to have a whole good evening. <laughs> good evening. Thank you so much for making time Thank and your you. doing with us. Yeah. Bye. Bye. All right, bye.